A new Israeli prime minister for the first time in 12 years. An ultranationalist high-tech millionaire is sworn in after parliament approves an unexpected coalition. But can this government do what Benny Netanyahu couldn't and keep Israel from heading to its fifth election in two years? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett. Well, after years of political deadlock, Israelis had been hoping for change. It finally came in a rather unlikely form. The new prime minister is Netanyahu's estranged protege, who heads a far-right party with just seven seats in parliament. But Naftali Bennett became a kingmaker in negotiations, and he now wears the crown in a coalition spanning the political spectrum. Eight parties, united in their disdain for Benjamin Netanyahu, managed to oust the country's longest-serving leader. And for the first time, the ruling coalition includes an Arab-Israeli party. But Netanyahu says he will be back, his Likud party still holds the most seats in the Knesset, and he has vowed to fight what he calls a dangerous left-wing government. That may not be an accurate description, but the coalition is tenuous at best. So can Naftali Bennett balance his government's stark ideological differences to govern, as he promises, for all Israelis? And will a change of personnel bring about any change in policy toward the Palestinians? Let's take a look with this report produced by Zainab Zara. Toda, toda, chaverim, ani mevakesh, ani mevakesh, chaverim, bevakasha, chaverim. Aida Tuma Sliman. Chaver Akneset Naftali Bennett, bevakasha. Ani, Naftali Bennett, ben Jim Yaakov, zikhro livracha, umirna lea, תיבדל לחיים ארוכים, מתחייב כראש הממשלה וכראש הממשלה החלופי לעתיד. המשטרים האפלים והאלימים בעולם. ישראל לא תאפשר לאיראן להצטייד בנשק גרעיני. ישראל אינה צד להסכם והיא תמשיך לשמור על חופש פעולה מלא. 
يعني هذه الحكومة اليمنية المتطرفة أيضا التي في صلبها الأحزاب اليمنية المتطرفة لن تكون سوى مزيد من التصعيد ضد الشعب الفلسطيني مزيد من سفك الدماء مزيد من أن يكون الدم الفلسطيني هو قود لهذه الحكومات اليمنية المتطرفة لذلك لن تختلف هذه الحكومة في سياسة التصعيد ضد الشعب الفلسطيني عن الحكومة نتنياهو الماضية Let's speak further about Israel's new leadership now. And joining me from West Jerusalem is Mitchell Barak, political analyst and former aide to Benjamin Netanyahu. He was also a speechwriter for Ariel Sharon and a spokesperson for former president Shimon Peres. From The Hague is Moeen Rabani, co-editor of Jadalia, an online magazine produced by the Arab Studies Institute. And from London is journalist and Middle East analyst. Tom Gross, thanks all three of you so much for being with me. Uh, Mitchell, I'm going to start with you because you are actually on this panel more of the glasses half full <laughs> panelist. Um, and I say that because you believe the government actually has a collective vested interest in succeeding that goes beyond just ousting uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. So what vested interests uh, do all their opposing interests have in common? First of all, they have uh, developed a, uh, a coalition government where everyone is kind of stuck in there. It's in nobody's best interest to break it off and leave because probably all of those people will be punished by the electorate if we go to another election. Uh, so the interest is really to, to be in there and work. And also there are so many small components, meaning most of the parties except the Air Lapides uh, Yeshatid party, most of them have about the same number of mandates. So, you know, they're all kind of sharing the burden equally. Uh, it's not even, uh, you know, you can say it's Prime Minister Bennett, but it's really two prime ministers that were elected. It's Prime Minister Bennett and alternate prime minister, soon to be prime minister in two years, Yair Lapid. So really the, the leadership of the country and the decision making is happening in a group environment and with two people at its head. So at this point, there's a high level of cooperation. You know, they've said from the beginning, it's more than just ousting Netanyahu. That's the first main goal. He's now gone. The country has not had a budget in three mm -hmm. years, okay? Because we've been in four election cycles. There are offices that are not working. There are programs that can't be funded. There are people that don't have money. There's still bailouts from the COVID-19. There's a lot of work to be done. And there's even two or three parties in there that haven't been in the government. Okay, and maybe so they are anxious to really get to work. Maybe saying glass is half full is an understatement. You actually sound pretty confident if you really think uh, Yair Lapid will be prime minister in two years' time and won't end up like Benny Gantz. Well, the first thing is is that there's trust among between Bennett and between Lapid and Lieberman and Saar and even Mansour Abbas and uh, Nitzan Horowitz from the Meretz Party and Mirab Michaeli. From the, uh, from the Labor Party. There okay. is a high level of trust that these people are sharing the burden. And Israel is a country. It's not a presidential system. This is a first among equals, and this is actually a first among equals. Meaning Naftali Bennett is just a little bit higher than the others, and he doesn't even have more mandates than some of the parties in the coalition. So he's really uh, leading from almost a, an electoral deficit compared to others. And that's what gives them the mandate to do it. Okay. And that it's in no one's best interest to go to elections again. Moeen Rabani, do you share Mitchell's uh, optimism there? I see no reason for optimism about anything that this um, incoming government will do, uh, particularly with respect to um, uh, the Palestine question, where this government will at best pursue a policy of of more of the same, but with respect to your specific question, I think that even under the best of circumstances, an eight-party coalition is by definition highly unstable. And what we already saw yesterday was that the new government wasn't even, even able to obtain uh, a parliamentary majority, an absolute majority, in, in its initial vote of confidence because one of its members decided to abstain. So. It's entirely likely that there will be all kinds of issues, expected and unexpected, that will arise in the coming weeks and months that will 
cut the lifespan of, of, this, um, of this government short. And of course, the main issue is what will happen to Netanyahu. Will he remain the head of the Likud and succeed in, in removing and in ensuring the defection of even one member of any of the coalition parties of the government? Or will he be removed from the leadership of the Likud, in which case the path is wide open for a um, for a right wing, a more right wing government, including the Likud and some of the current governing factions, which they will be able to achieve without going to new elections. Okay, I want to talk a little bit more about Benjamin Netanyahu in just a second. But Tom Gross, first, I mean, a lot of the equation for the success of this government does rely uh, on Neftali Bennett. He is very ambitious. He's an extreme nationalist, uh, and to make this work, he will have to compromise. I mean, how much? Is a man like that really willing to give? Well, he has no choice. I think uh, he will shift sharply to the center. Even among his eight-party coalition, his Yamina party, which already lost one of its members, has only six, um, six members of the 120-seat Knesset, i.e. 5%. So he has absolutely no choice but to compromise. And also, there's a kind of legal agreement with uh, Yair Lapid, who's the alternate prime minister, who's a centrist. And uh, Lapid's uh, Yesh Atid center party has three times as many Knesset members as Bennett. So yes, Bennett outflanked uh, Netanyahu from the right, but he's essentially lost his own right-wing electoral base and will, I think, have to govern from the center. He has no choice, I mean, from the Israeli center. And you don't think at all that Bennett supporters could be sympathetic to his limits uh, under this coalition? Well, some might be. It depends what he does. If he actually does uh, go ahead and increase settlement building and take a very hardline position, they'll be happy. But I don't think he can. It's not just that there are eight uh, parties in the coalition, and I've never heard anywhere in the world in a democratic country or, or any country of eight parties governing successfully together, and especially with huge ideological differences. As Mitchell said, they may trust each other, the leaders, but that's relative to the fact they, uh, they all came together because they don't trust Benjamin Netanyahu. They've only been in office a few hours. I can't see really how there won't be disagreements between them, ideological as well as maybe personal. So um, I think with Bennett, he, uh, no, he's, he's sort of decided to ditch his base, at least for the time being, and I think he'll try and govern in a kind of consensus way, taking okay. on board as much of Israeli society as possible. Uh, Mitchell, while uh, Moeen was speaking, I mean, for as much as he was disagreeing with you, I saw you actually kind of nodding in agreement with him. Uh, why was that? Uh, well, he does uh, make a point in that um, uh, it is going to be difficult for uh, for all of these parties to govern together. But uh, I do think that, that they will find common ground and that they will be able to uh, put their differences beside, even as Tom says, that this is the, uh, it's the largest government that he knows of that's ever governed, eight parties. We are in the land of miracles, um, so I'll be a little bit optimistic and cynical, but the point is, is the Israeli electorate is really beaten down because it's, it's you know, we've been for two years in a government paralysis, more than two years. We, even when Netanyahu started, when he you know called for elections, so I think it's very refreshing for people that we're actually going to first of all get rid of the divisiveness, some of the hatred, some of the the really negative rhetoric which has come from the prime minister and some of his parties. Some of it we saw that on display yesterday during the speech of the prime minister elect Naftali Bennett. So once people calm down and and we lower the tones, I think uh, they will be able to, to govern together. And it is true, again, like uh, uh, Moyne said, that you know he had extreme difficulty getting to 61 seats. He only got 60 versus 59. But I will mention right. that the other Arab party, the joint Arab list, is kind of serving as a safety net. And they kind of hid in the back and didn't vote with everyone else to make sure that the Bennett government would get in. And some of those members actually voted for the new speaker of the Knesset, Mickey Levy. Okay. So they do have a cushion here of a few more mandates from the joint Arab list, which is historic and significant in and of itself. Not only is Mansour Abbas's party in the government, for the first time an, an Israeli Arab party is in the government, 
but they also kind of have a safety net from the other joint Arab list for certain things that are okay. important because they also don't want Netanyahu. And their population, from all the polling that I've done, does want to be in the government. Okay. So, and also keep in mind that Bennett is now the winner. Netanyahu is the okay. loser. So people don't usually defect to the loser. They okay. defect and they join the winner. Mitchell, I like your uh, optimistic cynicism, if I can call it that. But uh, let's look at something arguably less positive. Moeen, I'll come back to you. Benjamin Netanyahu going forward. Uh, it's kind of personal now between uh, Bibi and, and Neftali Bennett. Uh, some say there's actually going to be a clear element of revenge at play between the two now. So how can Netanyahu actually uh, maneuver to bring this government down the way he wants to? Uh, and can you think he can actually return then? Uh, should this coalition fall apart? Well, for Netanyahu to return, there would need to be new elections, and that, I think, will be his biggest obstacle. But, you know, um, Netanyahu is a past master at incitement, and he showed that again yesterday. And he will, he and his allies will now be ceaselessly inciting against this new government, very much along the lines of his good friend Trump in the United States, mm -hmm that, you know, this is a radical leftist government. It's beholden to the Arabs, which in Israeli politics is, is, is the largest sin one can be uh, guilty of. And all he has to do is effectively shame one radical right-wing uh, member of parliament of any of the parties of the current coalition into um, uh, leaving the coalition, and it's game over. And Netanyahu will then be able to um, uh, successfully issue a vote of no confidence and go to new elections, which he may well win, because as was said earlier, um, many people who voted for Yamina and, and um, Avigdor Lieberman and so on will feel betrayed that they voted um, for a radical right-wing coalition, and instead they got a very broad one from the radical right um, to the center left. But okay. having said that, I do think the more likely scenario is Netanyahu being eventually deposed from the leadership of the Likud and then a new coalition government of right wing parties being installed without taking um, uh, Israel to new elections. Okay. I mean, you describe a pretty easy formula for derailment there. Tom Gross, let me ask you I mean, is there life left in Likud? Uh, without Benjamin Netanyahu at its helm? Um, <clears throat> there's certainly life left in the Likud. In fact, it's the only real substantive major party left in Israel. In the past, there was the center-left Labour Party, which has steadily eroded support, uh, or rather half collapsed over the last 20 or 30 years. And the Likud, uh, by Israeli standards, it has 30 seats, which is 25% of the Knesset. But by Israeli standards, that's huge. No other party um, has more than uh, about 17 or 18, and most of the parties have, you know, five, six, seven, eight. So 30 seats, Likud is easily the largest. Uh, to Netanyahu's credit, he has built that party up. And in fact, I would say that Netany ideologically as well, a lot of people are tired of Netanyahu. He's been in power too long. He's an abrasive character that has made a lot of enemies and so on. But ideologically, he's been quite successful, as we see by the fact that three or four of these other parties in the coalition are kind of spin-offs on the Likud. So there's certainly life left in the Likud. Paradoxically, if Netanyahu stays as the leader of the, of the Likud, because there's antipathy against him, that may be the only reason that the coalition stays together, doesn't go to new elections and keeps the Likud out. But if uh, somebody else manages to come to the fore and lead the Likud, as was just pointed out, uh, there could be a realignment without new elections and the Likud could enter a coalition with some of the existing more right-wing parties. Okay. Uh, Mitchell, I mean, aside from the political maneuvering for power uh, that might be at play uh, moving forward, let's talk about Naftali Bennett being in charge and what he can actually do for Israel. You mentioned a number of issues that this government will have to tackle, not least the budget. Uh, there's also the very serious issue of social division uh, in Israeli society that really has raised a very, it's very ugly head, particularly over the last year, uh, I'll, I'll say. 
Um, there is obviously an issue in divisions between Arab Israelis and Jewish Israelis, but there's also a lot of division between Jewish Israelis themselves, the Mizrahi Jews, the Ashkenazi Jews, uh, Sephardic as well. Is it in Neftali Bennett's political interest to actually try to bring more social cohesion uh, among Israeli Jews, or will he try to capitalize on that division the way we've seen done? No, actually, if you looked at his speech yesterday, he looked very prime ministerial, meaning he looked like he's matured, he looks like he's ready to lead, and he's ready to leave everyone. You know, uh, Muan had mentioned President Trump. Netanyahu gave a speech in Knesset that President Trump would have dreamed of giving at Biden's inauguration, but didn't have, but had the decency not to show up and not to give. Uh, Netanyahu got up there and trashed Naftali Bennett, and trashed his government, and trashed him personally and was just mean and not nice and wasn't wishing the government well in any way, calling it not legitimate, calling him not a leader and so forth. Bennett got up there and at, he was being screamed at by Likud lawmakers, <laughs> by the ultra-Orthodox, as you mentioned, you know, the friction between the religious Jews because they see him as selling out. They've said, take off your, your kippah. You don't represent Judaism. You're not a good Jew. Horrible things they said. And as they're screaming at him and he's trying to give his first speech as a prime minister-elect, he says, even though your people didn't vote for me, I represent everyone. I will represent the interests of your people. I, I appreciate and respect the ultra-Orthodox way of life, and we will protect it. So he's coming out with a message of uh, reconciliation, a uh, message of unity, and he's being met by people that are just being belligerent and mean and not nice. Okay. So I think he is going to try and, and, and heal Israeli society, because that's what they need now. And the advantage is, is he has a very wide-ranging government and a wide-ranging opinions of people to do that. And that is, I think, going to be his greatest challenge, because once he does that, or once he lowers the tone, as I said earlier, there will be a kind of new reckoning and a new looking at okay. government, and I think people will be more pleased with this new government. And Moeen, I'm not sure if you believe he can actually heal the additional divisions that I mentioned between Arab Israelis and, and Jewish Israelis, or if he'll even have that goal. Well, I think, I think it's important to recognize that Naftali Bennett is a um, radical right-wing ideologue, and the right-wing playbook, uh, which we've seen play out around the world, is that when you first come into office, um, you pose as a, as a uniter and all the rest of it. And once you run into um, political challenges, you very quickly resort to inflaming division and polarization and all the rest of it. And in the context of Israeli politics, um, I think probably the first big test is going to be tomorrow with this um, extreme rightist Kahanist march um, uh, which is scheduled to take place through occupied Arab East Jerusalem. And then you also have the issue of the whole um, secular versus ultra-Orthodox, uh, whose budgets are now up, up for grabs and so on. So I, th I think it's only a matter of time before you will see this prime minister um, resorting to polarization and division, and, and as is the case with many of his predecessors, resorting to incitement, not only against Palestinian citizens of Israel. I mean, he's previously compared Palestinians to monkeys and trees and all the rest of it, but also perhaps um, seeking to enter into okay. um, uh, foreign adventures in order to bolster his standing. Okay. Oh, wait, Mitchell... Do you, do you remember... Yes, do you remember Ariel Sharon when he came in? What was your opinion of Prime Minister Ariel Sharon when he came in? Probably far worse than Naftali Bennett. Maybe and look he'll at surprise how us. He turned out. And, and Maybe look he'll at how he turned out. He and united it's, it's Israelis. Exact, he was more exact, beloved than any prime minister by Spain, all Israelis. Reason. And he actually withdrew all Israeli troops from Gaza and gave it back Okay. To the Gazans, that he could make a terror criminal and out of it, fire rockets on Israel. Think about Ariel Sharon okay. before you. Uh, well, well, I mean, Moeen, we'll have. We can only hope that uh, Neftali Bennett will surprise us all. But Tom Gross, we just have a, a minute and a half left, and I'd, I'd like to get your final thoughts. 
Well, if you look historically, it's often leaders of the right or nationalists that come in and uh, make the ideological compromises. You have, for example, Reagan and Thatcher with Gorbachev. You have Nixon with China. You have De Gaulle with Algeria. In Israel, Menachem Begin and Egypt and so on. So I wouldn't rule out the prospect of Bennett le leading a government that could try to establish more peace treaties and possibly with the Palestinian Authority, though it's an extremely difficult thing to do. But I the fact that Bennett has previously been right wing doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be a nationalist in office, as we've seen from other right wing leaders who made compromises historically. Okay, and quick thoughts, Tom. Uh, Moeen, as well on Mansour Abbas, very quickly, if you think he could play a leading role in bringing that unity. No, I mean they've they've already, for example, removed supervision of the police from from the uh, committee that he will that he will supervise. Look, I, I take the point about right-wing leaders that was just made. Um, it's a valid one, but right-wing leaders tend to go against the grain, so to speak, when it's in their interest to do so. And okay. I think the challenge for the Palestinians will be giving Israel and the international community sufficient reason to change their policies by what they're able to do um, themselves in terms of changing the reality on the ground. It's okay. that simple. Moeen, I will have to give you the last word. So unfortunately, we are out of time for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank all three of my panelists sincerely so much for joining us and our viewers, as always, for tuning in as well. We'll see you next time.